go ahead and be turning to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, we started, we started that chapter last Wednesday, but we really got into it uh, more on uh, Sunday, and so we're going to try to finish that chapter up, and uh, probably try, we're going to try to get through the first at least about four verses of chapter 6 uh, and deal with all that information there uh, on the home in some detail. Uh, but just as a side note, Lord willing, on Sunday morning, our lesson will be on the home. And we'll look at more than just what Ephesians 5 has to say, but several other texts. Uh, but it'll be hard to talk about the home and not come back to this. Uh, some, so we'll, uh, some of that we'll come back to and talk more detail in our, our sermon on, uh, hopefully on Sunday morning. But uh, as we get ready to come into Ephesians 5, I want to quickly review the book of Ephesians, uh, or the theme and the outlines of the book. The book of Ephesians is about Christ and the church. Uh, the key verse we're going to come to shortly is verse 32 of chapter 5. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Uh, and so uh, that's really what I think the theme of the whole book is about, is about Christ and the church. Uh, we've been looking at a few different outlines besides the one we're following. Uh, this one was presented by Weldon Warnick. Uh, the outline is, I made you Christians 1 through 3, act like Christians 4 through 6. And then Wendell Winkler's outline, the church, God's eternal scheme 1 to 3, the church life they're in for uh, to six. And so uh, those are two alternate outlines we've been showing, but this is the outline we've been following. Chapters one through three are about blessings in Christ. Uh, we have the blessing of adoption, chapter one. The blessing of being made alive, chapter two, one through ten. The blessing of being reconciled, two, eleven to twenty-two. And the blessing of the mystery revealed, chapter three. Then in chapter four, we begin what is the practical application section of uh, the book of Ephesians. And that is, after dealing with all blessings are in Christ and you are adopted as sons and you've been made alive and you've been reconciled and all of that in the first three chapters, now because of that, here's how you need to live, four through six. So uh, how do you walk worthy of your calling? Well, you keep unity, one to 16 of chapter four. You're different from the world, 417 to 32. You're an imitator of God, 5, 1 to 21. That's what we talked about on Sunday morning. By being what we are in our relationships, that's where we are now, 522 through 69. Going through verse 4 is the family. We'll come back and break that down more in a second. And then put by putting on the armor of God, 10 to 24 of chapter 6. Our chapter content, chapter 1, blessings in Christ. Chapter 2, made alive. Chapter 3, the mystery. Chapter 4, walk worthy. And we're in chapter 5, be imitators of God. Chapter 5 on being an imitator of God begins with that idea of being an imitator and introduces it in verse 1 and explains to us the three ways or three kinds of walks that we need in order to be an imitator of God. Uh, we walk in love, 1 to 2. Uh, we walk as children of light, 3 to 14. And we walk carefully, 15 to 21. But coming into verse 22 now, where we are ready to pick up, is a parallel that is made. Um, if I was to say, to <coughs> me, if I was to say, what passage talk, would, would, when, when I, or I need a passage that talks about the, the roles in the marriage relationship. The first passage that's probably going to come to mind is this one here in Ephesians 5. Either this or 1 Peter uh, chapter 3 and 1 to 7. Uh, those two passages are the ones that deal the most with the roles in the marriage relationship uh, and, and those two texts. So those are what are going to come to mind. But it's not just about the marriage relationship. What he's dealing with here is uh, he talks about a parallel between them. Now here's something that is a little bit different in how we approach it today. Oftentimes we'll talk about it from uh, this standpoint. We're going to say, so we see the relationship of Christ, now here's the marriage relationship. And now that parallels it because we live in a day and time, and again, Lord willing, we'll talk about this some on Sunday, we live in a day and a time where uh, the marriage, or, or where the home is under attack. Uh, and, and they want to change the way, and, and these ideas are outdated. And so uh, we start with, here's what the, the relationship of Christ and the church and work backwards. Uh, I think for them... In order to understand the relationship of Christ and the church, it probably would have been easier to go the other way. And what I mean by that is, people at that day and time accepted, and it was just generally accepted regardless, uh, 
uh, for the most part, and even up until uh, within the last, say, uh, within the last hundred years, but definitely, but even within the last sixty or so, that the man was the head and the wife was to be submissive, and he was, to be, and, and, and those things were generally accepted, and so they would have understood that. And so, in order for them to understand the relationship of Christ and the church, a good parallel to explain that to them is what the marriage relationship. Though I think today, as I said, I think we probably think of it in reverse order. We start with Christ and the church and we come the other way because we live in a day and a time where the principles of marriage are not, uh, of what God has said about marriage are not generally accepted uh, or even for the parent-child uh, relationship. Now as we come into the marriage relationship that is just talked about here, there are four things uh, that are talked about. Uh, one is the parallel between the wife and the church in verse 22 through 24. Um, the husband's mentioned in 23, and so we'll have to come back to that. Uh, but So that really should be 22 and 24, and then 23 and then 25 to 29 is the parallel between the husband and Christ. 30, 31, and then again in verse 33 are some general principles. And um, what I mean by that is uh, he's explaining some things about marriage and about Christ in the church, uh, but more in a parallel of the relationship as a whole, and then um, in verse 33, or verse 32 rather, is the reason for talking about marriage, which again is the key verse to the book. He's really talking about Christ and the church, and he uses the marriage relationship to illustrate that, and so he explains the reason there. Let's begin at verse 22 through 24, and let's talk about the role of the wife as given here. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So, um, again, and, and, and so we'll have a little different approach on Sunday when we talk about the marriage relationship, because we're talking specifically about the marriage relationship, but we're, we're looking at the parallel here. As we said in hermeneutics, we will look at what did it mean to them first, and then we come back and make application. So, when he begins here, uh, in these verses, he told them in verse 22, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. So, he, what he's saying is, uh, they have a basic understanding of this when it comes to their relationship to Christ. They should be submitting to the will of the Lord. And so, how is a wife to submit? She's to submit to her own husband as to the Lord. But there's also a second side of that. And that is, I think Colossians explains that, that is she submits to him not just as she submits to the Lord, but it's in order for her to be, um, it's not just, it's in the same way, she submits to him as though she is submitting to the Lord because she's fulfilling her roles. And in reality, what she's doing is submitting to the will of the Lord. Um, in Colossians, it talks about the, uh, in, in one of those parallel passages, it says, uh, well, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. And that's talking about the relationship we're going to get to later on between the servant and the master. But I think that, that idea of that phrase, as to the Lord, it helps us understand uh, what he's saying. So there's two aspects. You submit in the same way as you submit to the Lord, but you submit as though you're submitting to the Lord because the Lord has commanded you to do so. Uh, and so by so doing, you feel fulfill his word. Skip to verse 24 now. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be their own husbands in everything. So uh, is the church to be submissive to Christ? Well, yes, go back to chapter 1. Go back to chapter 1 for just a minute again. What's the theme of the book? What's the theme of the book to Ephesians? Christ and the church. So we go back to chapter 1. And he put him, or he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to what? The church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So he's already discussed in the book the church, or Christ has authority over the church, right? All things are under him. As we say when we talked about that passage, if all things are under him, that means we cannot go anywhere else for authority. Parallel that to Colossians 3, 6, or 17. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the 
name of the Lord. And so uh, the church is to submit uh, to Christ, and so wives are to be to their husbands. Well, when we come to the parallel between that relationship and we see in verse 23 the husband's role, part of his role, it also explains to us why the wife is to be submissive. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So again, in, Colos or in, in, in Ephesians 1, 22, he gave him to be head over all things to the church. So the church submits to Christ. He's head over all things. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. So he's uh, the head of... Uh, he's, he's the head of her, and so he needs to take on that role of a head. Now, that doesn't mean he's a dictator, but he's a loving leader, and the rest of the chapter would explain that as it explains the love that he, uh, that he shows in having that sacrificial love. It helps us understand more about how it is he leads. So verse 25 now, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself uh, for her. Uh, something that's said, uh, th that's often stated in our society today to talk about this, is that uh, when it comes to the marriage relationship, is that uh, it's just not right for a woman to have to submit to a man. And so that's what the focus is on, is a submission. But do you know what the command of the man is? Love is wife as Christ loved the church. What did Jesus say? No greater love man know than what? To lay down his life for his for his friends. So if that's the greatest sense of love, and that's what Christ did, then what's the standard for the husband? It's to the greatest sense of love. And the kind of love that Christ demonstrates. So what he tells, what, what he's told is to have the love is Christ's love. Well, we, he says here, as he loved and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. Christ gave himself up for her. The church. Chapter or verse 2 of the same chapter would point that out, right? We need to walk in love. And uh, in talking about that, it talks, gives the example of the love of Christ who gave himself as a sacrifice. And so uh, the kind of love that he has is a kind of love that is sacrificial uh, in nature. And uh, it's the kind of love where he's not going to say, you know what, we're going to do it my way but he's willing to listen and to lead with listening to her input, and he's going to put her interest above his own interest. Uh, just as we talked about earlier in the chapters we need to do in our relationship to one another, that's what needs to be done in the marriage relationship. Part of the reason that the divorce rate in our society today is so high is because there's just not men who are loving their wives as they need to and having a sacrificial love. And if there was more sacrificial love and saying, you know what, I'm not going to stand my ground on on this thing that's not important where I could give and let you have your way and, 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 uh, and fighting over things that are pointless, then we wouldn't have such a high divorce rate. Yes? Back about Hebrews 5, as though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the fact that he suffered. So even Christ, if we have an example, was submissive to the Father, and men are submissive to other men. Elders were submissive to the civil government. Uh, we're submissive to our bosses, you know, the master uh, servant relationship. But we lived in a time where, like, a rebellious attitude is kind of glorified. But when we look, even Jesus Christ submitted in a way that none of us ever have by suffering all those things and all be, being nailed to the cross and dying there. Uh, so our example is even submissive to the Father. And we as men are submissive to other men. It didn't have to be a bad thing. We just hung the still, but pride would let us do that sometimes. Uh, you're right. You know, even going back before where we ended on Sunday, before we began this discussion tonight on the marriage relationship and this parallel between uh, Christ and the church and the husband-wife relationship, the very last verse of the previous section, the section on imitators of God, ended with this. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Um... And then the next verse says, wives, submit to your husbands. 
And so we talked about it, uh, and it's in a, uh, a, a, a somewhat different sense. We're submitting to one another uh, in that we're not willing to stand our ground. It, as long as truth's not at stake, if there's a way to compromise, love would demand that we compromise and, with one another. Um, in the marriage relationship, he is the head of the household. Uh, Paul and Timothy would talk about uh, more about that uh, as to the reasons. But uh, he's the head, and she's to be submissive. But, you know, as you said, we're to be submissive to one another. We don't talk about that part as, as the negative standpoint, though our society says that we have it our way anyway, so they would be against that as well, uh, though it's not as openly attacked as the marriage relationship uh, in, in, in terms of work and coming against it. It is in principle. But uh, you're right, we have to submit to one another, and so why are we picking on, why is this being picked on over here uh, as, as to the wife submitting to the husband? Because it's a command of all of us to submit. It's just a little bit different sense in the marriage relationship as he's uh, the head of the house. James, he said the wisdom which is from above is first pure, peaceful, and gentle. He talks about being will, willing to yield. So that's another thing that takes humility. I believe you mentioned it previously, maybe Sunday, that when things are a matter of choice, if we're willing to yield to other people, Life's going to be a lot more pleasant. Uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, picking up now, uh, let's go on down to uh, picking up in verse 26. So he, uh, husbands love your wives, verse 25, as Christ loved the church, gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. Verse 27, that he might present her to, uh, to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and without blem blemish. So, verse 28, husbands, are to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So in verse 28, there's a second standard for love. The first standard of love is love as Christ loved the church. The second thing talked about is love, is love his wife as he loves himself. I believe it was Matthew Henry, the commentator, that made this statement. Uh, or somebody made this statement. I think it was Matthew Henry, if memory serves correctly. Uh, a man's children are pieces of himself. A man's wife is himself. Um, and, and we see that in verse 21. The two shall become one flesh. And... I've said before, I think we talk about, uh, we'll come back to that in a second, but I think we talk more about that in the sense of the sexual relationship, but it's more than just that because it's the blending of two lives into uh, one. Uh, and so uh, if the two become one, he should love her as he loves himself. In fact, he pointed out no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. That is, he provides for himself the things that are necessary for him to have pleasure and to survive. And so she, uh, it being one flesh with him, he should love her and provide for her needs and care for her. He should nourish and cherish her just as he would his own flesh. Verse 30 now. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Um, so he said, just as the Lord does the church, for we are members of his flesh and of his bones. We're members of his body, as you go back into uh, the previous chapters, right? There's the one body, chapter four. The church is the uh, body, chapter one. And so we're part of the body of Christ. And so he loves and nourishes and cherishes uh, us. And so, uh, and so in the marriage relationship, the husband and wife are joined together and the two become one. So just as we are part of the, as he said in verse 30, the flesh and bones of Christ, we're part of his body. The husband and wife become one. And so the husband ought to have that nourish and cherish it for. So even then when he says love her as yourself, he still brings it back to the love of Christ and makes that parallel there as well. Verse 31 again, and be joined to his wife. Now I want to make a note about this, this word joined. This word joined uh, is a word that occurs this specific form. I'd have to do look more into the uh, every form of the word from the root, but this 
specific word, I believe, is used just uh, four times uh, in, in the Scriptures. And what this word render joined means is to be glued. Um, Thayer says the word means to glue upon or glue to. And so when it says they're joined, they're glued to one another. They're joined uh, together. Uh, one of the other uses of this word is uh, Matthew chapter 19 and in verse 5 for this uh, same quotation. This man, reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Um, chapter 10 of Mark and in verse 7, same thing. Parallel account to Matthew 19. It's a quotation from the Old Testament. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Uh, the other one is Acts 5.36. Uh, it says, For some time Theodos uh, rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. Uh, that was in the case where uh, the apostles were before the Sanhedrin, and Gamaliel was telling them, uh, basically, if it's from God, we can't fight it, and if it's from man, it'll fizzle out. One of the examples, he said, somebody came with prominence, and the others became glued to him, basically is what he said, and they're following of him. So that word occurs four times. This specific word occurs four, four times. Three of those are about the marriage relationship. Now, there are other forms of the word that may occur, but this specific form occurs four times. Three of them, the marriage relationship. The two are joined together. There's a gluing and a cementing. That shows something about the permanence uh, of marriage. When you glue something together, you're intending on it holding. Right? You don't, when you glue something, your thought is, this is going to stay. And so when they're glued together, it shows the permanence of marriage. Verse 33, we'll come back to verse 32. Let's go to verse 33 now, general principles about marriage. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Uh, so two more things mentioned. The husband, again, needs to love his wife as himself, which again, he paralleled loving him as himself is also the way that Christ loved the church uh, and the way that he cared for the church. Uh, and then the husband or the wife needs to uh, respect her uh, respect her husband. And so those are the, the two things he mentions again in verse 33. Let's go to verse 32 now. This is again the key verse to the book. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So Paul just did, if, if you're looking at it, uh, for a second, pretend verse 32 is not there for just a moment. If you're looking at the rest of the verses, it seems like Paul's entire point is about marriage. marriage. And he only brought Christ, uh, Christ and the church up to help sort of prove his point. But Paul's point was actually the other way around. He was proving his point about Christ and the church. He was paralleling that to illustrate it with the marriage relationship. So what's the point he's driving home? The point he's driving home is, as Christians, as part of the Lord's church, you are to submit to him because he showed this great love for you and he washed and he sanctified. In fact, think about some of those verses that he talks about. That when you look at it in the, in the light of the marriage relationship, he says uh, how he gave himself up for us. So we can stop there and say, well, okay, husband needs to have a sacrificial love like Christ did. But he goes on to explain more about Christ's love, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such uh, thing, but that she should be holy without blemish. The reason for his sacrifice, for the sacrifice of Christ, was so that the church could be sanctified and cleansed, that these could have that hope of heaven and stand clean and without spot before him. And so he brings that up in the midst of a discussion that seemingly without verse 32 we would look at and probably say that's all about marriage. And his point he's driving home is you submit to Christ and a wife submit to your husband It's the, in the same way because Christ is the head of the church, just as a husband is the head of the wife. And remember everything Christ did for you with his great love so that you could be part of his church. And that's the point he's driving home here in chapter, in chapter 5. Now let's move to chapter 6. Uh, just a quick side note before we begin chapter 6. Um, 
we're going out of town on either leaving Sunday after services or on Monday morning. So the plan is, the hope is that Sunday morning we'll finish up whatever's left of chapter 6. And then we'll go ahead and review uh, the book of Ephesians so that we can start Philippians afresh when I get back. Uh, so that way uh, we can start it and then the very next time going to chapter 1 instead of trying to start part of Philippians on Sunday and then letting it set and coming back and finish. So we're going to try to finish 6 and spend a brief review, a long review, however much time we've got left, depending on how far we get in the next 10 minutes. It will depend how much we've got left on Sunday. And do a review uh, of Ephesians real quick. And then when I get back, it will be the, not, it'll be not that Wednesday, but the Wednesday after the 15th, I think, something like that. 14th, 15th, 16th, I'd have to look at the calendar to figure out. But it'll be whatever that Wednesday is. Not, next, not, not a week from today, but two weeks from today that we'll pick up and start, uh, hopefully, uh, start Philippians. Chapter 6. The title of chapter 6 I would give is The Armor of God. That's the bulk of the chapter. But that's not where we start. Remember, as we go back to our outline, we're still dealing with being, walking worthy by being what we ought in our relationships. And so we begin with the parent-child relationship in 1 to 4. So here's what the child's reaction to the parent should be. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And so he talks about the parent-child relationship now in chapter 6. So what's that relationship like? Well, children should obey their parents. And... Uh, as he says, for, in the Lord, for this is right. So then again, there's, there's uh, the phrase, in the Lord. So it, it's fulfilling the Lord's commandment for one to do so. But it's not just the obedience. The obedience is a part we, we, we drive home a lot, uh, and rightfully so. When we tell young children, you know, uh, parents tell children, you, you, you need to obey me, you need to listen, and if you don't, there's going to be consequences. But one of those is that's given in the next verse is the term to honor. And this idea of honoring is something that does not have an end. So um, the, the obedience is something, obeying one's parents is something that eventually comes to an end. Right? You get older, you move out, you're on your own, all of this, then, uh, then you don't have that responsibility to obey anymore. But you know what responsibility still remains? the responsibility to honor. Thayer says the word honor means to estimate or fix the value. It is actually used at times of monetary value. Uh, in Mark chapter 7, Jesus is talking to, I think it's Mark 7, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees. I uh, remember the discussion, that's where they come to him, and they're talking about the disciples. They didn't wash their hands. And, and Jesus quotes from Isaiah 29 and in verse uh, 13, talking about, well, did Isaiah prophesy, you hypocrites, as it is written, this people shall honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines, the commandments of men. And as that discussion continues on, he points out to them that, you know, there are certain things they're willing to do and listen to, but completely ignore other parts of God's law. And one of those is, there's a responsibility to honor your parents, and you say that whatever I would have given to you is carbon, that is, it is given to God. And what he's talking about is, from a monetary standpoint, whatever you would use to honor your parents. So what he's saying is, so there's two senses. There's one in the sense that we uh, esteem and have honor for parents. So one, one uh, moves out on their own, one's out of the house, they no longer have the responsibility to obey, but when they go visit their parents or their parents are visit them, if they're asked to do something and they do it, that would be because of the honor and the love they have for them, that respect they have for them. But in the other sense, the word honor has to do with that monetary value, and that is there may come a point in time in which parents need to, or children need to care for parents as parents once cared for the children. And, they need to, and, and uh, it's not just something that one should do. It's something God commands to be done. As it's a command to honor. And he quotes from the Old Testament, it is the first commandment with a promise. Honor your father and mother 
that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. You go through the Ten Commandments and the first one that says, if you do this, here's that promise. It's the one on honoring your parents. The second part of this section in verse 4 is now the parent's relationship towards the child. And here's what he says. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So, uh, again, two parts here. The first is don't provoke to wrath, right? Now, that doesn't mean as a parent you're never going to make your child angry. If you have children, there's a time where you tell them they can't do something and they're going to get mad. That's not what it's saying. Don't try to do things to frustrate and to, eh, 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 just to frustrate and make angry, right? There's a difference in, in a child getting angry because you told them they shouldn't do something that they shouldn't do and, and trying to frustrate and make angry. Don't, don't exasperate, I think, is what the NIV says. So, you know, you're not trying to provoke them to wrath, but you're bringing them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Now, that's the New King James rendering. The word training, according to Thayer, means the whole training and education of children. That's what that idea of training is. That would include discipline. In fact, the English Standard Version says bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Go to Hebrews 12 real quick. Same word. Same word found here uh, in, in the first part of, of, of this verse. Uh, the, 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 one found, the, the, the same word found here rendered training. In Hebrews chapter 12, as it's talked about our relationship uh, to Christ, he parallels it there with the parent-child relationship. And here's what he said, the Hebrew writer says. And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Go to verse 7. If you endure chastening. Verse 8. But if you are without chastening. Verse 11. Now no chastening. That word chastening, guess what? It's the same word rendered training back in, in Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 4 in the, uh, in the New King James. That's why the English Standard Version opts for the word discipline. Now, it entails more than just discipline. It involves teaching and, and discipline. Uh, but that would be uh, a part of it. As Thayer said, it encompasses everything that has to do with it. Now... The second part is admonition. According to BDAG, another lexicographer, that is counsel about avoidance of improper conduct. So uh, there's two sides. There's the side in which you're telling them what's right, and then there's a sense in which you're telling them what is wrong. Here's how you need to live. Here's how you don't need to live. And that seems to be the sense of the two words. You're telling them what's right and how to live. Right? Here's how, you know, uh, you, you raise them up and you teach them about the Lord and you need to obey the Lord and here's how you need to live. And at the same time, you're saying you need to avoid this sin and, this, and these things over here, these are wrong. And it seems the two words have that idea. You're teaching them what's right, to do what is right, and you're disciplining them to bring them in that way, but you're also telling them here's what you have to avoid. Now let's cover this next section real quick. Uh, and then what we'll do is we can pick up with the armor of God on uh, Sunday morning and then finish out the chapter, and then do a quick review as well. Verse 5 through 9 now. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and sincerity of heart as to Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave and free. And you masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. So the first part, bind servants be obedient. Uh, not doing so with just eye service. By right? not doing so just to be uh, seen, seen by men. Uh, in, in the workplace, that's something you, you see all the time. Maybe you call uh, occasions, you, maybe you work with somebody that you remember they were the hardest worker as long as the boss was standing there. And then as soon as the boss was out of the room, they were sort of doing whatever. I, I remember 
I worked at a Chick-fil-A when I was in college, and I had, uh, was one of the night managers, and I remember going to the office one time. We had an employee that wasn't working, and so a couple of us went to the office and went and looked at the cameras, and as soon as she realized w that we were probably watching her, she got right to work. But then as soon as we turn our backs, guess what? It quit. And what he's saying here is, bond servants, don't just be doing it just to please your master and I service. And so, you know, the master's walking in and we're going to work real hard and we're going to get everything done and now he's gone. And uh, we're, we're work as to the Lord. That's where Colossians say, whatever your hand finds to do, do it heartily. Uh, that's heartily, H-E-A-R-T. And I'm afraid sometimes the problem is we think it says heartily. And that's how we ought to, we're going to heartily work. Barely do anything as opposed to doing it with all our heart. And so that's what he commands them to do. The second part of that there uh, is to the bond ser or the master towards the bond servant. Uh, don't, don't be threatening uh, to the bond servant, right? Uh, don't, don't, don't be harsh to them because remember, while you may be their master on this earth, you have a master. And guess what? He doesn't show partiality. And so if you're not right before him, there's going to be consequences. And it doesn't matter what position you held on this earth. What matters is if you're in a right relationship with Him. Lord willing, we'll pick up at verse 10 on uh, Sunday morning. We'll talk about the armor of God and finish out that section. And uh, then we'll have a few things to say about the closing remarks at the very end. We'll spend most of our time on the armor of God. And then we'll review uh, the, uh, the book. And then again, two weeks from today, Lord willing, that's when we'll start Philippians.